I'm in the process of trying to repair and restore a mad-ass mechanical calculator. It was built in the very early 1900s, so it's well over 100 years old, and it's a motor-powered calculator, and unfortunately the drive motor developed too much leakage to allow uh, it to be left as it was. I've done everything I can to try to restore the rotor as it is. I tried all sorts of uh, methods and solvents and whatever to try to reduce the leakage. I did get the leakage down um, from 70 milliamps down to a few microamps but when I applied power and ran it for a while the leakage started to come back up again so I suspect that passing current through uh, this motor, whatever this um, black material is, it's starting to conduct electricity. Now unfortunately I don't have the specification uh, timing anything else for this motor so um, I'm going to have to have to rewind it and I need to see which winding goes to which commutator segment in order to do that and uh, count the number of turns uh, etc. So the first thing I have to do is get the insulation off and so that's the first step I need to get all this um, black material out of the way. I also need to make sure I don't uh, damage the commutator now if the worst comes to the worst, it is possible to replace commutators, you can press them off, off the shaft but I'd need to find um, an exact match for the one fitted to this motor, at least something with the same number of segments and the same diameter and uh, I don't really fancy my chances in being able to do that so I want to try and retain as much of this rotor as I can and uh, so I'll start by trying to get this black material completely removed. Okay, now I don't really know what this black material is. I assumed at first it was just tar, which I come across quite a bit in vintage electronics, and normally you can dissolve it fairly easily. Um, this material has resisted um, most solvents I've thrown at it so far, and I didn't want to put anything too aggressive on, because up until now I didn't want to completely remove it. Um, but now I want to remove it, so step one is I'm going to soak it in acetone, uh, this may take several days, but um, the idea here is to uh, get the black material removed as far as I can. I'll do this just in the glass for now. Um, as the black material starts to dissolve away, I'll probably put this into the vacuum chamber and that will draw the acetone into the rotor and hopefully get rid of as much material as possible. I can see already that um, it does appear that at least uh, some of the black material is starting to dissolve and I can see, you, put, you, know, you can see it on camera, but I can see uh, the material kind of falling away and um, hopefully uh, that's a sign that uh, the acetone is attacking the black insulation and will eventually remove it all. So um, I'll leave this in here and uh, see how long it takes and if it uh, will start to dissolve this. Uh, if not, I'll have to try something else. Okay, I'm back working on this motor for the Madass Mechanical Calculator. And if you've watched the previous videos in this series, you'll know that um, I was trying to resolve a problem with excessive leakage on this rotor is uh, leakage from the uh, windings to the motor shaft and um, although I could improve it I couldn't get rid of it uh, entirely and uh, it could have resulted in a dangerous situation with the machine so I felt I needed to do something about that. So I need to rewind this and the first step is to remove the old windings but before I do that I need to figure out how it's wound and in this video I just want to uh, really go through the uh, steps required to rewind a motor like this. The steps I've taken with this so far were to uh, carefully unpick and remove the insulation that was wound uh, between the windings and the commutator and um, what I'm trying to do here is get it to the point where I can unwind some of the windings 
and I want to explain why I need to do that. Before I couldn't access, I couldn't even see the windings properly, they were all just in a solid mass of this sort of tarry substance. And um, after three days, although you probably can't see this on camera, the windings are now all loose. Uh, they're free to move, so I should be able to unwind these. And the reason I need to do that, rather than just hack them all off, is I need to see how they're wound. So firstly, uh, you'll see, oh you probably can't see, but there are two wires going to each of the commutator segments. And um, so I've examined this already, and the way I believe it's wound is a typical series wound rotor. So I'll just briefly explain how I think this is wound. If you're not interested in motors or you know how all this works then you might want to skip the rest of this video um, but otherwise I'll just fairly quickly go over uh, the way that uh, I will need to rewind this. So if we start with a diagram of the motor so there are two main parts to it. We have the, uh, the rotor itself, that's the, the mechanical part of the rotor, the um, laminated steel sections uh, and then we have the commutator which is the uh, copper uh, conductors that we see at the end here. In this case there are 12 slots and 24 segments on the commutator which gives us a fair indication as to how uh, this is wound. Also it looks like we have the coils in pairs and so that the way they're arranged on the uh, rotor we start from here for example then they're wound and if we count the slots you notice there are four uh, slots between the uh, up and down sections of the winding so it's wound like this and then the winding on the other side is wound like this and there's four on this side as well so we then have the field windings and these are effectively wired uh, in series. Um, the field windings are fine, uh, but you can imagine these as just being electromagnets and uh, or even um, permanent magnets. The next winding is one slot along in both directions. And then the next one is one slot along again. and it just progresses like that round the uh, rotor until all the uh, sections are filled. But in terms of the way it's wired it's relatively simple and it's not that critical in terms of which segment um, we use except in relation to the timing, the brush timing. So we have brushes that are 180 degrees offset and if I do another representation of how this is wired if we take this as being a linear version of our commutator where each of the uh, vertical sections is one of the uh, segments of the commutator then the coils are actually wound like this so they go from one uh, segment to the next and then the next one does exactly the same and they just go along like this all the way so they're effectively wired in series. The end one, if we call it X, actually goes back to the beginning. So all the windings are in series. So the only thing that's really important is uh, where the brushes are relative to the particular windings on the rotor. So the brushes will of course be 180 degrees uh, offset from each other. But the way this motor works is that if you forget for a second that you're putting power into it and just imagine it's spinning and again if we just assume that the field uh, windings are permanent magnets then if we spin the rotor we get a, uh, a current or a voltage induced in each of the windings that looks something like this. So it will reverse direction depending on whether the winding is going down this side or up this side. But also if we look at the 
a commutator, then of course as the rotor rotates, the segments of the commutator go past the brush in such a way that, for example, if it's going past um, a certain point, so for example if it's going past this point, then it's effectively short-circuiting this coil. And the same over here, the, the same instant, there will be another coil 180 degrees offset that's also being short-circuited because of the transition of the brush from one segment to the next. Now of course if this was to happen at this point in the uh, back EMF cycle, that's the, uh, the cycle where current is being generated, then effectively you would be short-circuiting um, the generator with quite a high output and the same 180 degree, 80 degrees out of phase. Uh, so you don't want to have the brushes um, short-circuiting the winding that is in this part of the uh, rotor. So, for example, if your brushes happen to be here, then it's important that we don't have the brush short circuit the windings that are passing by the field coils. So, in other words, the windings interconnections aren't important, but the slot that each winding goes into relative to the segments it's connected to on the commutator is important. And that's one of the pieces of information I need to get from the rotor. That is, which of the slots does this coil uh, get wound into? Because of course it's not, it's not an adjacent single, you don't wind it around each of these, though it's wound around um, a significant uh, proportion of the circumference of the rotor. And once I've started, I need to um, obviously wind the next coils according to a pattern like this. So the second piece of information I need is which way round the rotor do the coils progress. If I get it the wrong way around the motor will run backwards uh, and of course that will mean that the calculator will run backwards and it won't work. And uh, I also need to know how many turns there are on each of the uh, windings. It should all be the same but I need to count that off one of the windings and that will determine this voltage and that in turn will determine the speed that the motor tries to run at and it's quite important in a series one motor because this has to match um, the field windings. Um, I can of course just measure the diameter of the wire to get that so that's not difficult. Um, so that's the uh, basic information that I need. I need to know the number of turns, the position of the coils relative to the commutator sections that they're connected to, and I need to know which way to stack the coils around the rotor. The only way I can really do that without some uh, technical information for the motor is to examine the old one. So I need to get this under a microscope now and uh, start trying to unwind it figure out exactly how it's wound and then I can look at uh, rewinding it. Once I've got it unwound then uh, and all the uh, coils are disconnected I'll measure between the commutator and the shaft to make sure there's no leakage between the commutator and the shaft. If there is we'll need to find a replacement commutator and uh, get that uh, swapped out. Uh, the insulation for the uh, steel part of the rotor, the iron part, is not uh, critical because I'll be replacing all the insulation anyway. Um, but as I say, the next section or the next step is to figure out exactly uh, how this motor is wound. And then once I've got the winding uh, diagram sorted out, I can start rewinding it. So I spent quite some time with the microscope trying to figure out uh, how this um, rotor was wound. That is the relationship between the windings and the commutator. And um, it was quite difficult trying to figure out exactly the way it was wound. I'm fairly sure that it should be wound a uh, coil, um, the start of one coil and the end of that coil onto adjacent commutator segments. And they should be in pairs working their way around the rotor. Um, but I couldn't find the start and end of most of the windings and um, eventually figure out what was going on. So what I had to do to figure out the way it's wound is to 
um, number and disconnect all the terminations, the two wires going to each segment. And if I've got this right, then uh, two adjacent pairs of wires should be a common coil. So what I can then do is just scrape a little bit of the insulation off the coil and see which uh, wire that is. I can then figure out uh, which particular position on the rotor that coil is wound on. So uh, that's what I've been doing and uh, eventually found the start point of the windings and then figured out why I couldn't easily figure out um, where the start and end of all the windings was and that's because they haven't been laid down on the rotor in order. This was sometimes done on older motors to keep the um, the rotor balanced, not, not physically balanced but electrically balanced as it's spun and also to make up for deficiencies in the insulation that they had at the time. So the, what, what they did is lay down one um, pair of windings and then rather than move on to the next slot to do the next one they'd move round by uh, approximation of 90 degrees, lay down the next pair and then uh, fill in the gaps, be like tightening the cylinder head on an engine. Um, I won't be doing that when I rewind it, but I still need to go through this process to take the windings off. Firstly to determine the uh, number of turns on the windings should all be the same, and I think I now know what that is, um, but also just to confirm the pattern of the winding. Now so far I've taken off the first four windings, so I have uh, a nice collection of wire uh, building up. Um, so we'll do a few measurements while we're here. So the first one is to figure out the uh, diameter of the wire that we need to use. And um, so I'm just using a simple vernier. Let's say 0.11, allowing for the insulation. We'll use 0.1 millimeter diameter wire. I have uh, measured a few of the wires just to get an average and it does come out at uh, the same for all of it. Now if you try measuring further down you'll get something uh, quite significantly bigger because of this um, black tarry insulation that's still here. And uh, this is what's breaking down by the way, looking at the uh, insulation and measuring it, um, it does uh, give some very strange uh, results. It seems like it's turning into carbon, whatever this is, so I think that's uh, a large part of what the problem is. Uh, so what I've been doing is I've um, been going through this and unwinding the uh, individual turns. What I end up with is a, a plan for the particular motor. So uh, each winding, um, in fact there are two windings in each of these slots. So I've uh, labelled them, first one was A, second one's B. So that's the first set of windings if you like, but there are two uh, actual windings in each of those slots and that's very typical of motors like this and it allows for now a brush is a more efficient um, operation of the motor because the windings tend to stay more within the transition zone of the uh, motor rotation and so it causes less arcing makes the motor more efficient um, this makes it harder to uh, wind because you have twice as many terminations. But um, this is what I've been doing, and as I said, this is the first pair that I found, and the next pair is offset uh, pretty much 90 degrees. So that's the one I'm currently looking at. That's uh, the end you can see here. And what I'll do is I'll go through the rest of this. Uh, there should be 24 windings in total. I'll take uh, all of them off. I've done the first four, so there's 20 to go. And by the time I finished, uh, I should have uh, this diagram complete and I also at the same time generate a winding list. So this is just a um, number of turns, uh, where they go from on the commutator and which slot on the rotor they are in. And uh, also I've numbered the slots, or at least I've marked the first one. And uh, by the time I finish this I should have a winding list and all I have to do then is start at the bottom, work my way up and uh, put the windings back on. So that's the way I'm going about this. It's not the professional way to wind a motor. It's not the way the professionals do it. They tend to have machines that will just uh, spin one of these out in a few seconds. Um, but I haven't managed to find a company that will rewind this for anything even approaching a sensible amount of money. 
and um, so the only real alternative is to rewind it myself. Very well, slow and tedious process as you can probably see but um, hopefully we'll end up with a, a working motor. And just a quick test before uh, I finish this video. Uh, I want to measure between the uh, commutator and the shaft to see if we have any leakage. So I'll bring in the meter and we'll measure between here and the shaft. And as you can see we're getting nothing at all which is what we would expect and we'll do a full high voltage test on this once I've got all the windings removed and uh, obviously I'll re-insulate uh, this part of the rotor so we have a good fresh start. I use fresh uh, fish paper and uh, we should uh, have uh, a nicely insulated rotor by the time we've finished. Okay so that's it for this uh, video. In the next hopefully I'll have this completely stripped down and then we'll be able to start the process of putting the windings back on.